Coming up on Art Rocks, an artist who painted Louisiana as he found it when he stepped off a ship here 150 years ago. He is so precise with his style. I think this is what makes him so important for us today. We meet a sculptor who expresses shapes of nature in stone. My drawings are pathetic sometimes because I see it, but I can't put it on paper. That's not my medium. Chisel and stone is my medium. And hear from the woman behind a semi-autobiographical musical feast. My take on them is probably a little twisted. It also makes fun of musicals at the same time. And a group of musicians who are making stringed instruments sing to a whole new tune. It's the arts, so it ain't easy. But I do think that we are stronger together than we ever were or would have been separately. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thanks for joining us for Art Rocks. I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads magazine. Now many historians believe that art plays a vital role in chronicling the way people lived in years gone by. Marie Adrian Persac's vivid depictions of Louisiana as he saw it in the mid-1800s illustrate why art from pre-photographic times serves as a vital resource for the study of history. He is a French-born artist, cartographer, photographer, art teacher, civil engineer, and architect. He's a real Renaissance man. He is so precise with his style, I think this is what makes him so important for us today, is the fact that you see the surviving plantation mansion, but you don't usually see all of the accompanying fences and outbuildings and the kind of gardens that they actually had. Well, these are the kinds of things that Mr. Persak records. Marie Adrienne Persac emigrated to Louisiana from France at about the age of 20 and spent the remaining three decades of his life chronicling the southern way of life. Persac is well known for his depiction of the French opera house that opened in New Orleans in 1859 and was destroyed by fire in 1919. He is also highly regarded for making the only known painting of an opulent antebellum steamship before the Civil War. Though this piece is only 17 inches wide, Persac focused obsessively on every detail. It is the absolutely the only one. It was done on the eve of the Civil War, just as though he knew something was going to happen. And of course, they didn't have color photography then. So this is literally your only painting of the interior of the Mississippi River steamboat in color. On the uh, painting of the princess, there's a table in the foreground. It has a little note on it, and it looks just like scribble. If you put a magnifying glass on that, it says passengers are allowed to pay in office, and the office is to the left again there. So he simply does not miss a bet. The painter appears to have devoted more time to capturing life on plantations than anything else. His work opens a window, revealing how men and women dressed, the relationships between farmers and livestock, and how various animals shared spaces in what was at that time largely an agricultural society. It gives me a, a perfectly good view of what the South was up to 1860, 1861, before the War of Northern Aggression, as we're, as we're prone to call it here. So I get a, I get a, a rapid, quick-fire view of what this region looked like on the plantation road or on the river or wherever it happened to be, of what something of what life was at a very elevated level, as well as the character of the times and the style of the times, the way people lived, the way they interacted with one another or with their own animals or with their own occupations, I see perfectly. It's interesting to compare 20 large posters that advertised real estate available for sale in the 1860s. Some of these listings were created by draftsmen or illustrators, others were painted and drawn by Persac. The advertisements were preserved in the notarial records of New Orleans. It is clear that illustrators tried to make their offerings look attractive, but there's no depth. 
And then there are the Persacs, brimming with enticing detail, inviting sunlight, begging a buyer to visit the properties. The artist's ability to draw the eye to desired elements while masking extraneous areas is evident. Persac is also being celebrated for a rare depiction of a sugar house from days gone by. It is, as far as I know of, the only painting that is strictly dedicated to the sugar house and to the actual people, the workers in the field, cutting the cane. And it has everything uh, in it that you would want, and I think it's a particularly valuable historical uh, item for us because, as you know, in your own lifetime, we've gone from what, having a hundred uh, sugar mills to what do we have now, four or five. So this is a, a very exciting uh, image uh, as well. Also included in Persac's work, a porcelain vase featuring a southern cityscape before the Civil War, the city of Baton Rouge as Persac saw it. Today, much of Persac's work is in the holdings of the LSU Museum of Art in the Shaw Centre in downtown Baton Rouge. The historic New Orleans collection also holds a number of important Persac pieces. No matter where you live in Louisiana, opportunities to connect with the arts are everywhere, if only you know where to look. So here's a list of some of the goings on in the arts around our state. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, visit the website at lpb.org slash artrocks or pick up a free copy of Country Roads magazine. LPB's Art Rocks website also features an archive of previous episodes, so to see any segment again, just log on to lpb.org. Karen Heil was in her 30s the first time she picked up a chisel. That marked the beginning of a new calling, sculpting stone. Now, years later, you can find Heil's sensuous organic life forms installed in buildings, parks and cityscapes around the United States. Heil is now exploring new mediums and fresh forms, showing that passion isn't always set in stone. I never saw myself as a stone sculptor or any kind of a sculptor. So when my kids went to school, I decided to go to the Art Academy here in Cincinnati, and it was there that I was introduced to stone sculpture, and I was in my 30s at that point. I think what attracted me to stone carving and what I saw in it was that not only was it a challenge mentally, but physically. I went home tired, and I still do go home tired from the physicality of doing stone sculpture. Most of what I do in bas-relief stone carving is commissioned work. It's from either corporate America, hospitals, or people's private homes. My greatest joy comes from when they just say, do what you do. And then I can give them a narrative about what they're talking about based on natural forms that I gather from nature, flowers, leaves, even animals, birds. To begin the process, Karen sees the piece in her mind and then must put it on paper for her clients. My drawings are pathetic sometimes because I see it, but I can't put it on paper. That's not my medium. Chisel and stone is my medium. Once I have the drawing, I grid the drawing. It's a scale drawing to match the size of the stone, and I transfer that drawing to the stone. And then I begin carving. I just take the edge of the chisel and I start outlining the form. Say it's a bird. It'll be like a scratch in the surface where I outline that form. That's going to pop forward. That's the part that's going to stick out. So everything surrounding that bird has to come off. Then there's a leaf. Then I have to take everything around that leaf off without losing the other leaves. This is thinking three-dimensionally, so you have to know which things are coming forward and which things are staying back. When I make a mistake, nobody knows it because a leaf can be just about any kind of shape you want to make it. 
The tools that I use now are all pneumatic, but when I began carving, it was all hammer and chisel like they did in the olden days, but it takes forever to get a piece finished. And so I was introduced into pneumatic tools with a special hammer. That's a very small version of a jackhammer in a street. So only the chisels don't lock in. You hand hold both pieces and you guide it. So you're working both hands, both arms at the same time. And you control the amount of pressure that comes through that air hose so you don't take off too much or you can take off more by having more pressure come through. My stone that I use mostly at this point in my life is Indiana limestone. Most of it comes from Bedford, Indiana. I choose limestone, number one, because it's available. Number two, because it's soft. Number three, it wears well outdoors. And number four, it forces me to put a really good design in it. SD1, Northern Kentucky's wastewater and stormwater utility, is using art to educate people about our precious resource, water. They commissioned Karen to create three sculptures, Water, Gift of the Earth, Water, Source of Life, and Water, Sculptor of the Land. I actually went down to the quarries and I found these huge cores of stone that are probably 36 inches across. And I thought, wow, what are these? And they said, oh, that's just garbage. Those were core samples. They were each five feet tall, so we cut them in half. So we had these four pieces, and then there was going to be a fountain, so we had to core the centers out. So the title comes from Water Sculptor of the Land, which the water cuts through the earth and reveals the fossils, which tells the history of the land how many millions of years ago. And the fossils, some of them were carved, some of them were made out of terracotta clay. And that was a, a project I worked in collaboration with Alan Nairn, who is a Cincinnati potter now working at the Rookwood Pottery. Having worked with stone for years, Karen has taken on a new medium, clay. I had no idea what I was doing in clay, so I thought, how can I make clay more a part of me and me a part of the clay? So all of a sudden, one day, it just came to me, why not carve the clay? And then I found out, too, because I have essential tremor, that I can't throw and pull clay. I can't throw clay because my hand shakes the whole way up. So I hire somebody to throw a basic vessel for me. And then I embellished it. I add the handles, the decorative handles to it. I add the stuff that make the beak. I focused on pictures. And then the pictures reminded me of birds. So now all I do are these vessels in clay that are birds. And once I figured that out, and I liked that I had this carved clay vessel, then I thought, mm, something's not right. So then I decided I'll carve a base for it out of limestone. So then I brought my stone carving back into it. So now I'm conflicted between carving and making clay but I found a way to keep the stone carving into my life by creating these vessels. So that's how that all got started. And right now the clay vessels are just occupying all my time. I can't imagine not doing this. I mean, the only way I won't do this is if I'm dead because this is what I feel like I was born to do. It is my passion. And I think that's what my legacy is, to just fulfill your dreams by doing your passion, follow your bliss. To see more of Karen Heil's stone sculptures, visit KarenHeil.com. In Houston, Texas, Tamari Cooper's semi-autobiographical musicals have kept her audiences laughing for more than a decade. Now, Tamari Cooper's Old as Hell deals with mortality the only way she knows how, by laughing at it. Who is Tamari Cooper? <laughs> well, you know, you always have those questions like, what would be on your tombstone? or what would be in your obituary. And um, I think funny, funny lady is, uh, is very important to me. I am um, a real champion 
of comedy. Who is Thomas Jefferson's wife? Wheezy. <laughs> I'm a graduate of HSPBA, and my dear friend, who's more like a brother, uh, Jason Nodler, and I both went to school there. We'd both gone off for some college, came back. Jason wanted to do a play that he had written while at NYU. And uh, sort of from that point, we just decided we were going to do our own thing. I think like with everything, the more you do something, the more you can learn. Uh, that's the best way to learn is by doing. And uh, so that's how it began. I love musicals. I was totally raised watching all the old Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire musicals and um, sort of in my blood. My take on them is probably a little twisted. It also makes fun of musicals at the same time. I do draw on a lot of my own real life uh, stories, experiences, thoughts, freakouts, concerns, and then put them into a musical theater format. Some people have joked that, you know, it's almost like I'm working out my own therapy on stage for a paying audience instead of actually paying a therapist. I, I tend to be very open, maybe sometimes shockingly so, with some of the stuff I'm willing to share with, with an audience. All right, Cat Stevens! Hey man, how'd you get into my stream of consciousness? Ooh, baby, baby, it's shallow. <laughs> There's different themes every year, so it is a completely new show every year. But there is sort of a vaudevillian send-up, sort of a formula um, in them as well. This is what happens when you don't support theater people. Say it's like a one-woman show with a cast of thousands. The cast sometimes calls it summer camp for grown-ups. It's fun. <laughs> this show, Tamri Cooper's Old as Hell, is my 16th original show. I do make some statement in the show about the entertainment industry and how, especially for women of a certain age, you sort of, it is harder and harder to find leading roles. We certainly see that in Hollywood where these you know, leading actresses all sort of disappear after 40 or do very strange things to their faces <laughs> to stick around. In accordance with theater law, at your age, you're only allowed to play one and or all of the following supporting roles. Mother, stepmother, evil stepmother. That is all. You got greedy and you got caught. Are you saying I can't do my show? The Tamary Cooper show? You can do your show. Good with some other girl as the lead. I guess I am making that point, um, but I've been lucky because I get to sort of build my own world here um, and, and star in my own shows. I have audience members that actually have seen all of the shows, and so they've sort of grown up with me, which is really fun. Some that started as, as kids even that uh, are still coming to see the shows. It's like family or any kind of tradition. There's something comforting to return to every summer to see what someone's up to, what they're doing, what are they thinking. As important as it is for people to connect to things that bring out maybe darker, heavier subject matter that they can relate to or makes them question and think, I think comedy is also just as important. Um, the need to laugh, to share that, to be able to look also at the things in life that maybe are harder and uh, and find the laughter, find the humor in it. I think um, it's really important for one's soul. It's the opening number at the top of the show. Starring Houston's favorite on the new memory. Memory. Ah. For more information, visit catastrophictheatre.org. Bringing you back home now for our Louisiana Treasures segment. This week we're visiting the Louisiana Veterans Memorial Park in Lake Charles and celebrating a major tribute to one of our nation's war heroes. The people of Lake Charles developed the Veterans Memorial Park to show their gratitude to all the men and women in Louisiana who proudly served their country. 
One of the focal points of the park is a beautiful statue of a Lake Charles native who was killed in the line of duty, First Lieutenant Douglas B. Fournay. He sacrificed his own life while shielding the rest of his soldiers in his platoon from a mine explosion in 1968. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor in 1970, and the bronze statue was erected in Veterans Memorial Park in 2013 to commemorate his bravery. First Lieutenant Fournay's image was carefully crafted by artist Jane Stein LaCroix. He stands, helmet in hand, and weapon pointed down to show that his mission is now complete and he is home. People visiting the memorial can read the words of Fournay's son, urging us to not only to remember his father, but to consider how they too can make a difference in the lives of others. This project was funded by many individuals and organizations, including members of four days 1961 graduating class at Lake Charles High School. In the world of performance, collaboration between artists of different disciplines challenge, energize, and ultimately produce fresh and vital works. In this segment, we go within the Dayton Performing Arts Alliance as members prepare their latest high-energy collaborative production. As a new ballet springs into production, the Dayton Performing Arts Alliance is in the midst of another creative collaboration. I just find it endlessly fascinating to watch the work that Karen does with the dancers in the studio because she's, in a way, essentially doing the same job that I do, but in a, in a different medium, a different discipline with different language. It's always interesting to see how someone else handles the interpersonal relationship with the artists. For every minute of choreography you see, it's between an hour and two hours of work. But you really have to find things within the music, within the layers, to be able to start to pull steps from it. I can remember times when I would see a phrase in my head and then look and see that it actually came to fruition. It's just mind boggling. That's what I thought in my head, this is so great. It's also nice to see what the dancers have to bring to it. I mean, you might give them something, it may not work, and so you're seeing where they're gonna go with it. But that's a really important way for a dancer to grow because it helps them become choreographers themselves. It helps them to listen to the music better. They become part of the creation. People will say, oh, it's Karen's ballet, and I always say, you know, it's not, it's not my, because I didn't do that step, they did that step. The preparation routine for the musicians and the dancers is very different. The dancers, you know, take a fairly long period of time to learn the work. Standard is a five week rehearsal period um, to put on a show. And then our weeks are normally six day weeks, working about nine to five. The musicians on the other hand, you know, they have the music in hand about a month ahead of time. And they work on their own. For us to put together a ballet performance in three rehearsals, including address rehearsals with the stage and everything else, is a fairly normal occurrence. Uh, and it sounds insane, but that's the way we do it. As long as everyone does their homework, we're good. Neil is wonderful, uh, Neil Gittleman, our conductor, because he will come into the studio and watch and read the music at the same time. I spend time in the ballet studio watching the piece and learning what happens and making little squiggles in my score so that I know what's happening in the dance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the music. We can't ask for more than that and um, I think that that's one of the key components uh, to getting it right. Dancing to live music is so much better. I love it. When we're dancing with the Dayton Philharmonic, you can feel energy in the building. It's just uh, complete package. You can hear the instruments better. You can really hear like the soul of the violinist. The spontaneity and the energy that you get in a live performance that you can't really get anywhere else. And that's what makes it so exciting. It's the, the difference between a microwavable meal or a five-star restaurant. 
I mean, you're gonna get full one way or the other, but how do you do it? The new ballet is about the decisions we make in our journey through life. Four weeks from curtain, creative decisions are beginning to take their final form. We might finish it today or tomorrow, so I don't actually know what, how's it, how it's going to end yet. <laughs> I don't even have the music for it. Three weeks before the first rehearsal, the librarian has the parts ready for us to pick up. One of the challenges of playing uh, a new piece of music is there are often no preconceptions about what's supposed to happen. It's all a mystery until we get to the first rehearsal and put it together. And sometimes it just clicks and it makes sense, and sometimes we're all looking at each other like, what, what's going on? So that's why we have Neil. Creating something new takes inspiration, energy, and courage. The anxiety starts back up when you get into the theater, and then you look at it for the first time as an audience viewer, and you think, what the heck did I do? But you just have to walk away and trust that the baby will come out perfectly with all 10 fingers and 10 toes and everybody will be happy. It'll be an awesome show. I love collaborating. I think the fact that we have this very unique collaboration between the Philharmonic and the Opera and the Ballet, I think we're still the only city in the States that has joined forces. It gives us the opportunity to do things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And those things are starting to bear fruit, and I think it's the arts, so it ain't easy. But I do think that we are stronger together than we ever were or would have been separately. That's gonna do it for this edition of Art Rocks, but remember, you can always watch episodes of Art Rocks at lpb.org slash artrocks. You can also find out more about what's going on in our state on both the Art Rocks website and countryroadsmagazine.com. So until next time, I'm James Fox Smith, and thanks for watching.